Hi, loves. I've decided you are loves today. Well, you're always loves. Your queens, your loves, your sweethearts, your beautiful souls, your all the things. How are you today? Ah, I've got my little cup of tea. I know you can't see me on the podcast, but if you hear this kind of noise, it's my rings on my china cup. Feeling the chilled vibes today and the cozy vibes. And it looks like it's going to have a storm. And if it does, then it does. All right, I decided to make this week's episode a Q&A because I have a lot of questions in my DMs and sometimes I answer them straight away and sometimes I'm like, oh, I want to go into depth with this question. So I'm going to answer in a podcast episode. So I've chosen three today and we're going to kick off with Julie's question. And Julie says, What's your view on some people becoming vegetarian or vegan when they develop an eating disorder? And I've just wrote bullet points. I'm just going to speak very intuitively and it's just going to flow and I'll probably go on tangents and all the things, but so it is. Well, my question is always why? So if someone is vegan or vegetarian not in general. Well, I guess in general, it's important to always ask why, what is your motives and inspiration behind doing anything actually, as a matter of fact, but in terms of eating disorders and restrictive eating, I always like to know why, what is the honest reason behind wanting to be vegetarian or vegan? Why, why, why? And ask yourself why like three times at least Unless, obviously, unless it's actually completely, honestly, authentically, genuinely for the animals and for how you feel towards that ethically and all of that, you probably will already strongly know your why. But a lot of people that I coach and myself included in the past are just hiding behind veganism or vegetarianism because when we ask the why, it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes, and that is restriction is not an action, it's a state of mind. And as I was saying, some may adapt these diets like vegetarianism, veganism, um, paleoism, ketoism, don't know if there are actually isms, but I'm just saying they are, for ethical reasons, environmental reasons, or for health reasons. But my personal story is when I went vegan, on and off, by the way, because when I was binging, I was far from vegan. And actually, when I was in the anorexia, veganism, I say it wasn't a thing. And by the way, if there's, I've got any vegans listening to this, which I think I have, because I have a lot of vegans listening to this, which didn't make sense what I just said. Um, there's no disrespect or fun making in any way because I will share with you how I feel about it ethically as I go. But when I say that it, veganism wasn't a thing back when I was anorexic, obviously it was because there were people cared about the environment and animals and all those things for however long since that's probably our natural state, isn't it? Let's be honest. But it wasn't a trend and I'm not saying veganism is a trend but you know what the marketing industries do and the food industry is they just anything they can make money with and make it convenient for people as well they will latch onto that and make it into a trend so when I was anorexic it wasn't very popular there we go Victoria that was the easiest most respectful way you could have said it even popular though actually is yeah, it's not, I'm not vibing with that either. But you, you, if you were an avid listener, you know my heart now, you know what I'm trying to say. But I went vegan as a way to restrict and not be penalized for it. Meaning it was so much easier to say no to things if there was no backlash, right? If If there was no vegan option available, and I said, oh, no, I can't because I can't eat that because I'm vegan. Then there was no backlash at all. So I was actually hiding behind the veganism. And when I, this is funny, but it's not funny. The last time I decided to kind of claim myself a labeled vegan was probably maybe th three years ago, two and a half years ago now. And that was genuinely genuinely 
because I'd watched a documentary. I think it was called What the Health, or maybe it might have been called From Knife to Knife to Fork or something like that. And I saw the way that animals and things were treated. And I was like, fuck that. I am not having anything to do with that shit. I'm going to be vegan. And then I went out for dinner the next day and ordered a tomato soup. Because I was like, right, that's vegan. And I don't want any butter on the bread. And the tomato soup came with a dollop of creme fraiche on the soup. And I was like, for fuck's sake. And honestly, I just gave up there and then. And that is probably, I mean, I care deeply about animals, but honestly, I'm being completely honest, as I always am. That's just, from my part, that's just being ignorant, putting my needs before the needs of animals. I guess some people could see it that way. And I just chose from that day to just tune into my body and eat what I wanted. But, or should I say, and, I source things ethically, So whenever we buy meat, it's from a place you can't even, you don't even know about unless you're part of the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden, that's what we call it, is like a big allotment, but we don't have to actually do the gardening. Um, You join this club and then you pick your own vegetables. You may have seen it on my story. You pick your own vegetables every week and you can only be in contact with the meat and the chicken person and the honey person and the cheese person and the milk person through this little group. So it's going right back to like an old community, like before we had all the commercial and big farmer and stuff like that. And so we only buy, and I know I'm very p- privileged to be able to actually, in fact, it's even, it's actually less expensive. It's a smaller investment than the supermarket actually. So as I was about to share, yes, I'm in a very privileged place, and people that haven't got this little community, but there will be things, ask around in your area, there will be people, especially if you're manifesting them to you, who do this, and it's actually cheaper than the supermarket, but if you were to buy organic and grass-fed and free-range, that is more pricey in the supermarket, I get it, and I was in also in a privileged position to be able to buy that before we found this little Garden of Eden club, just give it a new name, really like it, Um, so we buy free-range cows well we don't actually buy the cows but the mints the free range chicken the free range eggs um the honey that it are taking the bees are taking really good care of all of that so we actually only buy and eat really ethically sourced produce and then we pick our own vegetables and I talk to them and all the things I was not I've not always been like that and there's no judgment at all if you're not that I mean who who the hell's even got time to do that some people haven't so that's how I choose to eat. So I eat anything that I want, but I choose ethically. If I'm out at a restaurant and let's say the burger catches my eye on the menu, sometimes I will just have the burger without even asking like wh- what where the meats come from. And that's a choice. And I take full ownership and responsibility of that. And if I wasn't so ignorant to it, if I'd seen what had happened before I ate said burger, I wouldn't choose the burger. But that's just me being radically honest with where my mindset is around food and and meat and all of that. So going away from that, from the vegan thing, I did also choose to eat vegetarian about a year and a half ago. And that has own that had nothing to do with um actually the animals or anything to do with restriction or anything like that. And this was to do with general health, like Vouter, my now husband, is I say Intel the health stuff. He he he's never had disordered eating before, and he does have moral judgments around food. And we talk about this all the time. And I just ignore it now. But he decided that we weren't going to eat meat. I mean, I can do what I want, but it's it's easier as a household to eat the same because of health reasons and X, Y, and Z. And I was like, okay, whatever. I don't really care. But then my body started craving meat and chicken and fish. So then, and I started research doing research by myself and I found that, I mean, whatever research you look at, it all contradicts each other. So then apparently me is really good for your health and you need it and blah, blah, blah. So I just thought, you know what? I'm just gonna fucking practice what I preach and just completely eat intuitively without any healthism or veganism or anything like that, unless it's like morally right for me to do so and just eat me if I want to eat meat so that's what I do now um so I have experienced definitely hiding behind veganism with my eating disorders in the past except when I was binging 
But with the vegetarian, it wasn't to hide behind an eating disorder. It was for, quote, health, which didn't turn out to be very, quote, healthy for me anyway in the long run. But if you think that someone you know might be hiding behind veganism or vegetarian and they have an eating disorder or at the very least disordered eating, there's a way that you can detect, in my opinion, if someone is is hiding behind vegan or vegetarian with an eating disorder. And that is to notice, are they always seeking out other alternatives? For example, are they eating Oreo cookies instead of standard cookies? Are they seeking vegetable burgers and vegan cheese instead of normal burgers with normal cheese, right? Because I'm not I'm not saying that everyone should always copy what anyone else eats. And if you're vegan, you have to have an alternative all the time. But you know what I mean? Are they using it as an excuse to avoid food altogether? Or are they having substitutes? Orthorexia, which is fear of food that is not, quote, clean or whole or healthy, in quotes, can also be hidden behind or more so go hand in hand with veganism. But only you will know the real reason as to why you're choosing to be vegan or vegetarian. And yes, we, you know, not everyone, but most of us listening to this care about our health. And that's a good thing, in my opinion. It's not a moral issue at all, though. If, you, if you're if you not that bothered, that's also fine. I mean, we're not the health police. Nobody should be the health police, by the way. And if they are, then that's a reflection on them, not you. So yes, in terms of health benefits, it can be beneficial to add in more types of foods or avoid or not eat as much as some types of food. But you can only get to that place of choice and following your body and any health goals that you have when you've been through the absolute full recovery process and had zero restriction, zero moderation, zero limitation. It's the only way through. So you you can get to a stage where if you, for example, in your family history, you've had colon cancer and then now they've found studies that certain processed meats are linked to colon cancer. You can then perhaps choose to not eat as much as that if you want to for health reasons, right? There's Everyone has their own story behind it. But I would like to invite you, if you are vegan or vegetarian, start to question it for yourself because I've had clients start to eat meat and to eat fish after they've recovered at the end of recovery. And then they realize that in fact, it was the eating disorder that was actually convincing them that they didn't like meat or fish or they they didn't eat it for ethical reasons when actually that was a lie. And the eating disorder was so convincing that this person and these people weren't even aware of that happening. So just lovingly question yourself like, wait, I'm gonna check in with myself am I not eating meat or animal products because of the ethical reasons? Really? I mean, like I said, going back to ignorance, where I am in some things, definitely, if we actually knew what happened and where it came from, if we if we did, I'm sure there was only, there'd only be 5% of people who still wouldn't care and would eat it anyway. I definitely wouldn't. And maybe you wouldn't too. But knowing that we do live in the world we live in and we don't see where it comes from and all of that. I mean, that's another conversation, isn't it, altogether? Would you, are you really vegan or vegetarian for the right reasons or is it a way to restrict or to limit food? Only you know the answer to that. So start to question it for yourself. And also going, following on from this, in my, this is Victoria's opinion. This is not medically backed up or researched or whatever. This is from my personal experience and coaching and supporting clients over the years. I think people can also create gluten and dairy, which is lactose intolerances by avoiding these foods long-term due to the eating disorder because the body stops making certain enzymes in order to break down these, so gluten especially. So when the individual eats the gluten or dairy again after a prolonged period of restriction, they han- they tend to have a very unpleasant reaction. Now, with regards to dairy and lactose intolerance, that can be, there is a, there is a thing that can happen as you get older, you can lose your 
um, tolerance to dairy because I can't remember the statistics. Maybe I should have looked this up. Um, there is so many people that actually still continue to have the enzyme that breaks down the lac that le- breaks down lactose, and not everyone has that enzyme. So some people generally don't have the enzyme, and some people do. Thank God I do. But you can lose it as you get older. So, but apart from that, I genuinely believe those that are in an eating disorder that have suddenly become lactose intolerant. I believe it's more stress related because stress or trauma, physical or emotional, can affect digestive function and lead to temporary lactose intolerance. The same with gluten. If you're freaking out because bread or gluten because of all the stuff we hear about healthism and all of that, and we shouldn't be eating grains and we shouldn't be eating gluten and blah, blah, blah. If you're freaking the fuck out when you're eating said foods and shaming yourself for it and making yourself feel bad about it, then that's stress, you know, which can lead to trauma. Like I have or had, and it's it comes and goes, this breathing thing, I've shared about it before, where I don't feel stress at all, but your body doesn't forget until it's com- been completely released. This breathing thing of like like as if I'm stressed, it feels stressed in the body, but I don't feel stressed in my mind before I go to eat food, especially dessert or chocolate. And that's because of all the times I've been eating that type, those types of foods in the binging days, especially. And I've been shaming myself so much for doing it. It's a fucking trauma response. So your body doesn't forget. So until it can be fully released and I'm going through some stuff and working on that so it it will be fully released at some point there's many layers to all of this going back to childhood but you can create that intolerance for yourself like I was saying due to physical or emotional stress or trauma that can change your digestive function if you're scared of eating something like dairy due to weight gain or health consequences then you can train the body to react badly when you eat it. And there's an uh, there's always an underlying reason as to why someone has developed lactose intolerance. The same with gluten intolerance. There's always a reason why. And in my opinion and in my experience, it's due to fear of the food and the stress, the shaming, all of that, which of course we can let go of and we can rewire and, and all of those things. So you can just continue to eat the foods that you've always eaten and enjoyed. So don't forget how powerful the mind is. There was that study done, again, I haven't got the link to it, but I'm remembering it from when I read it and it was so interesting. And all the people on Instagram have shared this too. Um, There was two studies, uh, one study, sorry, two groups. One, One group was given a milkshake that was high fat, high calorie. Another group was given a milkshake that was low fat, low calorie. They were told the people that were drinking the low fat, low calorie milkshake were told they were drinking the high fat, high calorie milkshake and vice versa. The high fat, high calorie milkshake people were told they were drinking the low calorie, low fat version, but they weren't. It was the opposites. Right. And what what happened was I can't remember the statistics, but it was statistics the statistics for it but it was mind-blowing it was so high it was insane the majority of the people I think if not all I don't know if I can go as far as saying 100% but it was pretty close because I remember being like what the fuck um the majority or all of the people that thought they were drinking high fat high calorie milkshake and indeed they wasn't they were drinking a low calorie one their body responded in the same way as it would respond if they were eating the high fat, high calorie milkshake. The same happened with the other group. The other group that were thinking they were drinking, thinking they were drinking the low calorie, low fat, but were indeed in fact drinking the high calorie, high fat, their body responded in the same way as if they had drink, drank, eaten, drink, drunk, the low calorie one. You know what I'm saying? That was a complete tongue twister, but it blows my mind. That is how freaking powerful belief systems is. We attract what we believe about ourselves. I genuinely believe if, (laughs) believe I'm talking beliefs about beliefs. I genuinely believe if someone genuinely believes that they can fly or something, I honestly think they could. If they genuinely believed it with every cell of their being, right? 
I really believe that. So something to think about, you can bring this on yourself, not so celiac disease, that's like obviously something medical and where your immune system attacks itself, but even that is dis-ease and even that is, re- is linked to emotional stuff going on in the body from childhood, I would say. So the body's adaptable, the body is very efficient. If you think about it, if you've not eaten gluten or dairy for however many years or months because you've been restricting due to the eating disorder, then your body will stop creating what it needs to digest those that gluten and dairy on a regular basis because it just doesn't need it because it's very efficient. So if you keep eating the thing, if you introduce the thing again, your body might have a massive reaction. You might be like, oh my God, see, I knew I was intolerant to that. I just can't eat it. But if you keep eating that on a regular basis, then your body will get used to it again, really. So as long as there's no underlying medical conditions such as celiac, then your body will get used to it again. The countless times I've seen this play out in myself and with when I started recovery and in, with my clients is insane. The worst thing you can do in eating disorder recovery is an elimination diet. Your body will guide you as to what to eat, what types of foods to eat, but first you need to eat enough. If I had been coaching the, the amazing clients that I've coached in eating disorder recovery, and the second they started getting digestive issues, I was like, yeah, well, you probably need to go on an elimination diet or need to be really careful. Maybe your body doesn't like sugar or gluten or dairy. That would, no fucking way. That would have been the worst thing I could have said to them. So it's just dealing with the discomfort, trusting your body. And I'm going to go into more of that in a moment because now we have Sh- Shannon's question. Let me just have a sip of my tea. Now we have Shannon's question and Shannon says how to reintroduce variety back into the diet after prolonged after prolonged restriction. So as I was saying, I think this is actually linked to the answer to the above question, especially in regard to how the body physically responds to food. And I'm going to go into the emotional stuff as well. Give your body time and for it to get used to a variety of foods again. As I was saying, don't immediately stop eating the foods that seem to cause an issue because this is gonna create even more of an issue long-term, especially if you've been restricting for a long time. Because if you've been restricting for years, months, like however long you've been restricting for, you may have a hard time eating different types of foods when you introduce them again. And although it might be a really uncomfortable experience, give it time and honestly settle in for the shit show, probably quite literally shit show of digestive discomfort, because the only way to the other side is through and restricting will not help. And everyone responds differently. So one of my clients was in the toilet every hour some clients get really constipated and that's just the worst because a lot of food's going in compared to what they used to eat in and none of it's going anywhere. And that's due to many different reasons about your stomach emptying super slow because of all the restriction you've had before. Your body's very smart, but your body needs proof and evidence and it needs to trust you that there is enough coming in. Then it can start to fire itself back up again, get your metabolism fired up, your digestive working, all of that stuff. So you have to just get used to being uncomfortable first. You can take care of yourself in the best way possible. You can wear loose clothing. You can open some windows because you might have a lot of wind. You can take digestive enzymes, they natural ones, they can help. They don't make it go away, but they can help. And as well as probiotics to support your gut bacteria and just be gentle with yourself. You can if need be, reduce portion sizes of some types of food as as long as it's not coming from a place of like restriction, as long as it's coming from a place of I generally need to just like die down some of this uncomfort with my digestive system because I'm almost not being able to handle it, then that's okay, especially fruits and vegetables, and then gradually increase those over time. So fruits and and vegetables can be a big um, thing that can cause a lot of digestive issues as well as 
you know, processed foods that you've not perhaps been used to eating, but do not cut anything out. If you've got a great coach that your coach can, of course, support you through all of this and give you guidance on what to do and what not to do. But just be gentle with yourself and increase the foods over time and cut back not completely, but cut back to a smaller portion. Let's say you eat lettuce and you have a really bad reaction to it. Just have a tiny bit and then gradually increase it. The same goes here for acid reflux. Now, not many people talk about this, but it's a thing, especially for those with bulimia and or anorexia bulimia tendencies. This is very common. So if you constantly have acid reflux and the eating disorder will say to get rid of that, you just need to make yourself sick and then you're all good to go and you reset and then your life's going to be better. That's a lie. It will be better in the very short term because it's relieving that discomfort and it's it's perpetuating, um, not perpetuating, it's relieving the anxiety, but you're perpetuating the eating disorder and the fear. So with acid reflux, get yourself some medication. Yes, it's not long, it's not ideal long term, but to relieve the discomfort of it whilst you're healing, I definitely recommend it. Why would you suffer when you don't have to? So get medication and work through it. And I promise this gets better. Your body just needs to come back into its natural balance again, it needs to start trusting you, working properly. You can't just expect your body to work perfectly again because you've decided you now want to recover, thank fuck you have, by the way, when you've been starving it and abusing it, your body, I mean, for many years, that's not okay. So you literally have been starving and abusing yourself. So be kind to yourself, be gentle with yourself and give your body all the time it needs. And you'll also get to truly know your body as you go through recovery and into food freedom. My body, for example, does not do well without carbs really. It doesn't like avocados and it doesn't like iceberg lettuce either, funnily enough. It also doesn't like halo top ice cream. Now, when I have, when I don't have carbs, it's not like I purposely don't have carbs, but for some reason, if we cook a meal that's like more cheesy base with perhaps more fats and less carbs, I, well, I'm, I'm happy as long as it's been pleasurable to eat. My body is not happy. I'm on the toilet. It's not good. Oh, I need to take my fish oil. That just reminded me I'm going to do that after I've recorded this episode. I also forgot yesterday. Not that you needed to know any of that, but you know how my brain works. No filter. Um, Also with avocados and lettuce, I bloat up like I'm like five months pregnant and I'm in the toilet in excruciating pain and I'm in the toilet. So my body doesn't like those things. And Halo Top ice cream, when I used to eat that, or was it, it might be Halo Top or there's like another one, Oppo. I can't remember. When they first came out, I would eat them in huge amounts, the whole tub and things like that. And then it would give me the worst wind ever. So my body was like, bitch, that isn't food. That's chemical. Like go and get some actual real ice cream or something. (laughs) So to answer this question from an emotional standpoint, not a physical standpoint, let me just go back to the question, how to reintroduce foods again after a prolonged period of restriction. I would either... My number one vote always is go all in. Go all in, hire a great fucking coach who knows what she's doing or knows what he's doing, who has done this process themselves and coach many or the people through the same process and has got results, obviously, in recovery and freedom themselves and with their clients and go all in, which basically means eating anything you want, whenever you want, in any amount you want, push through all your fear foods, all your barriers and just fucking do it. Jump in with both feet and you get to recovery, to freedom a whole lot quicker. It's more challenging at the beginning, absolutely. But for me, that was the only way to go because that's my type of personality. If you can't, I say can't like that because I believe everyone can, but if the overwhelm is just too much and there's a lot there to work through in terms of trauma and all of that, you don't have to go all in. You can still absolutely recover. But what I would recommend there is to use a color-coded method. So I use this with my clients and then introduced introduce these gradually. So this will look like me asking you to write yourself a list of foods in the red category, the orange category, and the yellow category. And 
excuse me, the red category would be the super fear, fear food. So the foods where you're like, holy shit, like I'm having an anxiety attack thinking about eating them, or I always 100% binge on these foods. By the way, there's nothing wrong with binging. It's saving your ass. There's nothing wrong with binging at all. It's necessary, but I'm using binging as like a fear food way because you would most likely, until you've worked with me, be afraid of the foods that you binge on. And so the orange foods would look like medium fear foods, like not you're still really scared of them, but not as scared as the ones in the red category. And then the yellow ones, obviously the ones that you're still afraid of, but not as strongly afraid as the orange ones and the red ones. And then start with picking a few from the yellow, the yellow column, at least one a day, and then introduce different ones like every other day or every third day. And then obviously start taking one from the orange category and then the red category, et cetera. But your coach will be able to, should be able to um, support you through this. And then before you know it, your food fear list in the different color columns gets smaller and smaller. And that way you're starting to introduce all the foods that you used to be afraid of that you no longer are afraid of. So that's a really nice way of doing it. Just takes a bit longer, that's all, but that's okay. And also in general, check in with yourself. And again, a very good coach will be doing this anyway, automatically without you having to do anything. Check in with yourself from now, from time to time and ask yourself, okay, what foods am I still afraid of, if any? And am I eating a variety of foods or am I sticking to the same foods all the time? Now, if you're sticking to the same foods all the time and you actually really enjoy the foods that you're eating, then that's completely fine. If you did want to add in different color vegetables to get different nutrients in and things like that, I would encourage that definitely. But if you're eating the same amount of foods because it's safe and there's kind of some rules there or it's not okay to eat chocolate in the middle of the day, but it is okay to eat it as much as I want at night, start to notice these little rules and varieties, um, variety restriction and challenge those and a, ch- and a coach will support you through this. So as I was saying, get support from a coach or a family member. And also you can learn from others who do have a healthy relationship with food. So you can see if all the people around you eat the same thing every day, or you can see if other people just easily get a McDonald's because it's the easiest thing to do and they're not freaking out about it. So you can learn from people. And I say this a bit cagey because unfortunately most people are in diet culture But there are a few people in the world who actually aren't, who actually have a normal, healthy relationship with food that hasn't been fucked with. And they eat for pleasure. They eat for health. They eat for nourishment. Eating is easy. That's where I am right now. And it's fucking amazing. It took a long time to get here. It doesn't have to take a long time. But I, for some reason, needed to have 20 years of eating disorders before I was ready to uh, to be free. Well, I say for some reason, obviously I know why. I've worked through it all, the body image, the self-love, the worthiness, the childhood stuff, all of that. Okay, so last question is from Liv. Let me just have a sip of my tea. This is a very powerful question. Well, it's not a powerful question, but you'll see what I mean. It's got a very powerful answer. How can I find an incentive to recover when historically I'd relied on external people and factors to spur me on, especially coming from someone who is depressed with no sense of direction. Well, first of all, Liv, I am so sorry that you are depressed or you feel depressed. Like, I'm so sorry you feel that way and I'm giving you a big hug. And I have a question around that. Is it clinical depression? excuse me, meaning it's affecting your brain chemistry, like your actual physical brain chemistry is not, is not right, is off. Or do you feel depressed? Because there is a difference. And I'm just curious if you want to share. And I invite you to reframe. And I'm not, you didn't say this outright, but the way the question was written was like this, and this might help anyone. Instead of saying, I am depressed, reframe it to I am currently experiencing feelings of depression or if you're clinically depressed I'm currently experiencing depression because you are not depressed you are not your body you are not your brain 
you, my love, are not depressed, okay? You're just feeling that or experiencing that at the moment. That can help with the separation. Okay, and you said that you have no direction and this is the problem. This is what's keeping you stuck and this is what has probably motivated you to ask this question. You need direction, otherwise you don't know where you're going. If I asked you to get in the car, I don't know if you drive or if you're old enough to drive, I'm not sure. If you get in the car and then I say drive and you'll be like, well, where am I going? Exactly. You you can just aimlessly be driving around. But if you're not actually going anywhere, if you don't have a destination in your mind or in Google Maps, you don't know where you're going. So you need direction to get where you want to go. The only direction you need is food freedom and self-love. So I invite you to create a vision for yourself play make believe because the way you feeling the way you're feeling currently i'm really assuming that you you're just going to be so far away from what self love and food freedom even feels like you can't even imagine it and i get it i couldn't either play make believe allow your inner child to come out to play and just write this vision this dream down allow yourself to dream because dreams become reality dreams become intentions and then your reality when you start taking aligned actions towards them. But first of all, you need to know what you actually want. Where do you want to even go? What does food freedom look like to you? If you haven't already, download the free taste test on my website. It's the first, I think it's four modules. There's a lot of free content there, I'm not going to lie. Really valuable content. There's all of the first part where you create a vision for yourself It's all on there for free with all my worksheets and voice notes. So definitely go through that and create a vision for yourself and use that to support you. And then when you've got that vision, you can start making strides towards that. Another way of looking at it that can be quite playful and quite fun is to imagine you've got a self-love bank account and always be depositing in your bank account, your self-love bank account, not withdrawing. So yeah, metaphorically, you've got a self-love bank account. Depositing in that bank account would look like what? Eating at least five, six times a day, stopping body checking, reaching out for help, being kind to yourself with kind, loving self-talk, all those types of things, resting. That's depositing into your self-love account. Withdrawing from your self-love account would be forcing yourself to exercise when you don't want to, or it's compulsive skipping meals, restricting, talking to yourself like shit, not taking care of yourself. So that can be a really helpful vision or visual to use with the self-love bank account. And then you can ask yourself, this is really powerful, choose a figure, a mentor or a person that you respect, trust and look up to and they are where you want to be. And then start asking yourself, what would blank do? So say if you chose me as an example, what would Victoria do right now when you're struggling to make a choice about lunch or whether you're anxious about having the chocolate or whatever, what would Victoria do right now? And if you don't know what I would do, ask me. And if you want to choose someone else that resonates with you or you follow on Instagram or a friend or whatever, ask them like what would they do and then you get to understand like oh okay so I'm just going to do what that person would do that's giving you direction and you then you'll get where you want to be but I have questions for you that will help you with your vision what do you want why do you want to recover do you want to recover for yourself for your mum for your future self for your future self that has a family and children of her own What do you want to do in this lifetime? What do you want to explore? Who do you want to be? What do you want to experience? You are are a creator. You get to choose all of this, okay? So the answer to those questions, that is going to be your incentive to recover, my love. You are not meant to do this alone, but you can choose to recover and then actually recover and do the action with the right support. And I would like to share with you a post 
that I wrote a couple of months ago that I think will really help you live. So I'm going to literally read word for word because I wrote this. And I said, the two most prominent things that enabled me to fully recover and live in genuine and absolute food freedom. Number one was when I truly realized that nobody was going to save me. There was no man on a white horse. There was no fairy godmother. But there was, however, me, myself, and I, and mentors, coaches that could guide me through my own journey to freedom. That realization felt very lonely at first and sad and scary. Then something shifted. Number two was when I realized that I, and only I, had the power to change. Only I had the power to heal. It was me all along. Only I could validate myself. Only I could know that I was enough. Only I could pretend that I was enough if I didn't believe it from the beginning. Nobody else could do it for me. That hole within me could never be filled from the outside, no matter how much I tried. I realized that my belief in limitation was the only thing that was keeping me limited. When I felt that limitless power within me, everything shifted. I knew that I wasn't my body. I had a body. I wasn't my emotions. I experienced emotions via feeling. I wasn't my thoughts. I was a thinker of my thoughts. And so I got to choose which thoughts did I want to believe? I didn't have an eating disorder. My brain did. And I am not my brain. I am consciousness that has a brain in this human body. Stay with me. I have a question for you. Where were you before you were born? Energy cannot be created or destroyed. This is science. So you were somewhere. It's impossible for you not to, it's impossible for you to have been nowhere. And here's the thing. This is really for you, Livia. I'm assuming Livia, Liv. We are programmed to be powerless, yet we are all fucking creators. We are programmed to be powerless, yet we are all creators. You can fully recover from whatever eating disorder, disordered eating or body hate cycle you are in, no matter how long you've been in it. This I know for a fact. I do not care how many years you've had a therapy that hasn't worked or how many times you've been in inpatient treatment and in outpatient treatment. I know you can fully recover and live in self-love. And so ultimately, Liv, my question to you is, do you choose to live or do you choose to die? And I mean die physically dying or immensely and emotionally dying inside and just not even living, just surviving. Only you get to choose that, my love. And I know that from the past in my experience as well, having a wonderful, loving and very pushy and persuasive and controlling perhaps family to try and push you to, to recover, they can't do it for you. You have got to want it for you. So I hope the answers to my to your questions has helped in any way. I really appreciate your questions, all of you. I love you all so much. And if you would like access to me answering your questions personally and giving you homework and holding you accountable in a private group, there's only about, I think there's like eight of us in there. It's a very small, intimate group. Then join my Binge on Self Love, my membership. It's 20 euros a month. It's amazing. I give so much in there. It's a beautiful little community. And I answer all your questions and we have a good time. We've got a book club going on in there. I'm recommending things to watch, to read. And so come and join us. All right, my loves. Sending you so much love and I will see you next week. Mwah.